This is WPTV Treasure Coast News. For hours, the search was on for a Treasure Coast teen feared missing. What that incident is shedding light on and those willing to jump into action to help. Also coming up tonight, Mother Nature putting the squeeze on one industry along the Treasure Coast. How Indian River County farmers are dealing with a historically low yield. Good evening and welcome to Treasure Coast News on WPTV News Channel 5. Each Saturday here at 7, you can join us for dedicated coverage of stories and issues in and around the Treasure Coast from Stewart to Sebastian. You see today we are at Adams Ranch in Fort Pierce behind me where they're doing much more than just raising cattle. Later on, I'll give you a look at what they're doing to help land conservation on the Treasure Coast. And we are tracking some activity on radar across uh, the Treasure Coast and Okeechobee on the Saturday evening. Not too much near the coast, just a few little showers offshore that could graze the coastline. But as we turn our attention inland, you can see the majority of the intense activity is basically just to our west. But we are seeing a little rain here, western Okeechobee County near Bassinger too. But overall, just about a 10% chance of seeing some showers showers through the evening and there you can see uh, the lightning. The heaviest rain is to the south and to the west, but Okeechobee uh, right there on the fringe of some light showers and of course a little activity offshore, but everything will be diminishing with the loss of the daytime heating. Current temperatures still warm out there tonight. 79 degrees in Stewart, 80 Port St. Lucie, 81 Okeechobee. Now with dew points in the upper 60s and low 70s, it's quite humid out there. And when you factor in the humidity, this is what it feels like right Right now feeling like 83 in Stewart and it feels like 77 degrees in Okeechobee 83 for Sebastian. I'll be back in a few minutes with what you can expect for your Easter forecast. This week we brought you the story of an all out search for a missing St. Lucie County teenager. While the girl was found safe for hours this week, the community worked together to find her. The situation in Port St. Lucie near Treasure Coast High School provided insight into how law enforcement searches for missing children. Within a short time, police were able to find videos of the teen walking in communities. While the initial concern was that someone may have been following her, it turned out to be a case of a student looking to skip school. That's according to police. Law enforcement experts shared insight on how these initial calls are handled. Law enforcement agencies are compelled to take every report of a missing child seriously until the facts of the specific instance reveals that there's something else that may not be as nefarious. Teen was later found by a local volunteer and member of the Guardian Angels community organization. This week, I got a chance to speak with that Guardian Angel driven into action that ultimately helped bring that teen home. And it's not the first time he's gotten to the bottom of a missing person's case. She was walking this way. Okay. It didn't take so bloodhounds, we a chopper or detectives to find a missing girl Monday. I figured this is the spot. It was Michael Lincoln McCrate who saw her walking and encouraged her to stop and talk after he too spent hours looking for her. And then I called PD. He's a member of the Guardian Angels Fort Pierce chapter. His commander Ned Childress was the one who gave Michael the green light to go searching yeah. in the first place. I'm very proud of him. But go find her more or less was what I said. Go find her. The Guardian Angels have chapters all over the country and world. Their main mission is safety patrol, walking unarmed through crime heavy areas to deter crime, wearing their token red berets and white t-shirts, trained in things like CPR and conflict resolution. We're a big deterrent for a lot of situations that goes on. And when we're around, stuff don't happen. But in this case, they use their boots on the ground to help find runaways. Extra eyes and ears for law enforcement. You know, they, they, law enforcement have their hands full. Children says over the last several years, their chapter has found two runaways in West Palm Beach. After we heard about this, this young kid ran, running away, and we actually uh, went to the mall. Uh, we, spot, we spotted him. We called the police department, and they came, and they, they picked him up. They've also found a runaway in Fort Pierce and this latest in Port St. Lucie. They've also assisted with two other cases. They pass out flyers, they drive around and walk through communities. Michael has long been passionate about law enforcement, security and overall helping other people. Now he's more motivated to keep volunteering. I believe that if you have two legs and two hands, um, you should at least get off your butt and go at least make yourself useful. For the latest developments on this story or any of our top stories, scan the QR code on your screen. It will take you to our WPTV News app, which is free. 
Well, with the cost of housing on the rise and more and more people looking for affordable housing, a real estate website tracked a record number of home buyers moving in search of that affordable housing. Locally, the migration happens to be to Port St. Lucie. Some homes are not only less expensive, but new construction is creating more inventory. Realtors say buyers coming from northern states are passing up on Palm Beach County because the Treasure Coast is more affordable. Even with efforts to increase home inventory and address affordability concerns, homelessness remains a concern. The surge in higher rents and mortgages across the area are pushing more people into homelessness on the Treasure Coast. TC Palm reports that accounts for more than 800 people falling into homelessness. That's a 4% bump from last year. St. Lucie County had 21 additional people fall into homelessness since last year and in Indian River County, nearly 29 more. Martin County was the only area to report a drop. Port St. Lucie may still be working through trash collection issues involving Waste Pro, but if you live in the area, you will be getting a new garbage cart to help with the buildup as the city moves to once a week collection. Each household in the city will receive a 96 gallon cart late this summer. Once you get your new cart, the old one can be used for yard waste. Under the new automated collection program, garbage would be collected once a week. The carts cost about $60 each and the cost will be spread across 10 years. The new carts also have a 10 year warranty. In Martin County, all serious and deadly car crashes have happened on just 12% of the roadways in the last five years. Now the Martin Metro Planning Organization is developing a Vision Zero Action Plan to prevent traffic deaths and serious injuries. No one should lose their, their mother, daughter, father, son, brother, sister, child to a traffic fatality. And if we can come up with a plan to prevent traffic fatalities, even if it's only one, it's worth it. The planning group is not only looking at road designs, it's working with deputies and police to come up with the best ways to prevent crashes. Now, exclusive Treasure Coast stories from our partners at TC Palm. Money, collaboration, and political will. These are the big three for those who are homeless on the Treasure Coast. TC Palm's top premium story this week looks at the increase in homelessness in Indian River, St. Lucie, and Martin Counties, and what is being done to help those in need. The Treasure Coast Homeless Services Council estimates about 800 people do not have a home here. That's a 4% increase from 2021. There was also a 51% increase in residents staying with family and friends because of economic strains. These spikes raise questions on how to solve this social issue and whose responsibility it is. A new first of its kind homelessness task force in St. Lucie County is attempting to answer some of these questions. It hopes to set a precedent for Indian River and Martin counties and determine long-term solutions for nonprofits and government. More affordable housing is one thing elected officials agree could help curb homelessness, but differ on how to make it happen. Also this week, outdoors writer Ed Killer explains why a dry winter could help protect our waterways. For these stories and more exclusive Treasure Coast content, visit tcpalm.com premium. I'm executive editor Adam Neal for TC Palm. And we're tracking some inland storms. So will these impact your Saturday night plans? I'll have the answer coming up after the break. After the break, Adam's Ranch is a Fort Pierce mainstay, their mission to aid conservation. A Fort Pierce baseball star returns home. How he's inspiring students at John Carroll Catholic High School to achieve their dreams. This is WPTV Treasure Coast News. Well, behind me is the largest cattle ranching operation on the Treasure Coast. Adams Ranch covers 40,000 acres of Florida pasture between St. Lucie and Okeechobee counties, but also Madison and Osceola counties. The big focus, of course, raising the best beef. But Adams Ranch has also received awards and set the standard for considering the environments in everything they do. It's much like a vision of old Florida. On thousands of acres of land outside of Fort Pierce, the Adams family has built a local and national name in cattle ranching with roots spanning four generations. Leanne Adams Simmons is part of that fourth generation. They're smart. 
but they are, they want to know what we're doing for sure. This family legacy started when her great grandfather, Alto Adams Sr., bought some of this acreage in the 1930s at a steal. Probably about $1.50 an acre. <laughs> the ranch was at first an escape for the late Adams Sr., a Florida Supreme Court justice. They bought it kind of for recreational purposes. But Leanne's grandfather, Alto Adams Jr., or Bud, wanted to be a cowboy. <laughs> Bud later helped expand the ranch into a growing cattle operation, even creating his own cattle breed. That is the Brayford. Larger and better suited for Florida's climate. He loved genetics. He worked really hard, developed the Brayford breed in the 60s. They tolerate the heat, the bugs. Out here today. So these are our composite breeds. Adams Ranch has become the largest cattle ranch on the Treasure Coast and among the largest cow-calf ranches in the country. So we're probably producing um, over a million pounds of beef that stays in the state of Florida. Their beef sold in restaurants and Whole Foods, and now they're cutting into the home delivery market with subscriptions and shipping. We're an old cattle ranch, but we are very new in the beef business. But before all of this, Leanne says Bud made a name by making the quality and diversity of his many acres a priority. He was also known, you know, for his forward thinking on conservation before anybody else was really thinking about that type of thing. Setting an example for other ranchers with innovations in wetlands management, attracting all kinds of animals to live here, helping to balance the ecosystem in a natural way. Use, you know, the least amount, if any at all, pesticides, fertilizer, you know, all that. He just believed, you know, in the full biodiversity, um, circle of life, just try to keep things as natural as possible. The Adams have also put 8,000 of their acres into a conservative easement. That means the land can never be developed. They will never see houses on there. This is the type of water that you're going to see throughout the ranch. It's quite clean, clear water. Protecting wildlife habitats, wetlands, and this old Florida view to be enjoyed for even more generations of Adams and all Floridians. The ranch is also doing more direct to consumer sales as one way of managing inflation impacts. As you can imagine, they too are feeling the hit from the cost of fertilizers, feed and packing costs going up. The president here tells me their fertilizer and fuel costs have doubled. Meat hasn't yet, but they are feeling the squeeze. As we head towards summer, a manatee feeding trial is ending. A wildlife expert tells us the trial program has been a success. The Fish and Wildlife Foundation of Florida worked with FWC officials to purchase lettuce for manatees. The organization raised more than $160,000, which they used to purchase more than 200,000 pounds of lettuce. They also raised nearly $900,000 to start replanting eelgrass at seven sites in the Indian River Lagoon. They'll start planting the new eelgrass within the next few weeks. And toxic blue-green algae has turned up at the Port Mayaka Lock and Dam on Lake Okeechobee. Officials are asking people to stay away from the water. It's the second alert issued since January of this year on the Treasure Coast. Congressman Brian Mast introduced new legislation this week to tackle toxic algae blooms like the one seen on the Treasure Coast more and more frequently. It's called the Northern Estuaries Restoration Plan Act, or NERP. Mast says his proposal would help create a roadmap for the Army Corps of Engineers to stop dangerous discharges altogether from flowing into local estuaries. As one of the top line items, eliminate all discharges to the St. Lucie, harmful discharges to other waterways as a specific part of the plan that does not exist in SERP. If passed by Congress, NERP would also require new infrastructure for restoring natural water flows. Citrus farming is big business in Indian River County, but this year is on track for Florida's lowest yield since World War II, causing local farmers and fans of orange juice to feel the squeeze. WPTV News Channel 5's John Shaman has more on how local citrus growers are coping with inflation, among other challenges. At Riverfront Packing Company in Gifford. Grapefruit will hold. Grapefruit can store. Fruit's in the cooler. President Dan Ritchie looks over the last batches of this year's grapefruit harvest. Leslie went to Japan. Uh, Jaguar went to Belgium. What came out of the grove, Ritchie says, was good. Oh, we had a good season. The crop was excellent. The internal quality and flavor was, was very good. The problem, though, not enough fruit overall. Ritchie says the recent spike in the cost of orange juice is purely a supply and demand issue. 
citrus greening most, most recently, urban encroachment, hurricanes, they've all contributed to a decline in the, in the citrus volume. The citrus crop reaching lows not seen in decades. The latest USDA forecast predicts 42.6 million boxes of citrus this year, down from 52.8 million last year. Just 20 years ago, Florida produced around 287 million boxes of citrus. Declining yields, but rising costs for the grower. We're seeing a doubling of the cost of fertilizer right now, right when we're starting to fertilize. We're seeing a doubling of the cost of, of diesel. Richie says they can't necessarily pass on all their added expenses to the consumer. There is a glass ceiling on what the price point can be for consumers to continue to take away. We're aware of that. But with a product still in high demand, despite all of the challenges, Richie says the citrus industry will survive. Things will be a little different. But we are not going away. We are very optimistic about the future. John Shaneman, WPTV, Treasure Coast News. And we are tracking a little bit of rain this evening, most of it either offshore or well to our west. But as you can see, some stronger storms mainly out of the viewing area, but a little bit of that shower activity has encroached into Okeechobee County right there, uh, just south of the town of Okeechobee and southwest of Taylor Creek and just to the west of Bassinger. But this activity is pushing west, so it will be moving away from Okeechobee. Now we do have some coastal showers out there and from time to time these showers could just graze the coastline, but they are very light in nature. So a mainly dry evening ahead. Here's a time lapse from Jonathan Dickinson's State Park, a beautiful day, a mix of sun and clouds. However, it, it was a little warm with that humidity creeping up too, and that's going to be the case for your Easter Sunday, warm, humid with a slight chance of storm. So it will look fairly similar to what we saw today in Vero Beach. We made it up to 83 degrees. Our low this morning was 62, and that is very close to our seasonal averages. Current conditions, upper 70s near Port Mayaca, Canal Point and Okeechobee, 76 in Indian Town. 79 Stewart, 77 Palm City, Port St. Lucie checking in at 80 degrees, Sebastian 78, and Vero Beach right now 77 degrees. So a mild forecast through this evening. Temperatures staying in the upper 70s with partly cloudy skies. Now wake up temperatures Easter morning. Perhaps you're going to a sunrise service. It will be just slightly cool, but it's comfortable. Mid 60s across St. Lucie County and Indian River County, right around 71 for Stewart and Palm City. 70 in Hobe Sound and by the lake temperatures 67 Okeechobee 68 Pahokee and 67 Port Mayaka. So on the Viper cast it shows tomorrow few little coastal showers possible but most of the activity once again will be inland. All right let's take you now to the seven day forecast we can see warm and humid uh, Easter is tomorrow 85 but scattered storms on Monday then we cool things down Tuesday through Saturday with highs in the low 80s and low end rain chances. Here are your Treasure Coast Sports highlights with the ESPN 1063 Sports Team. What's going on, everybody? Tyrus Smith, the ESPN 1063. You know, baseball season is in full effect. Very thankful for that because, one, well, we get MLB games, and who doesn't love that? Two, former superstars from our area, well, they come back to town. And I'm talking about former John Carroll standout Jay Allen. Allen is currently on the Cincinnati Reds' single A minor league team, the Daytona Tortugas. They have been playing the Palm Beach Cardinals all week long. He was drafted by the Cincinnati Reds with the 30th overall composition pick in the 2021 MLB draft. This week hasn't been his best showcase as he only accounted for two runs and one hit so far. But still, it's all about growing his game and becoming a better all-around player. Hitting is such a, a big part of this game, but um, the thing I, find, I found myself doing was limiting myself to just being a hitter. Um, that's not what I'm, a, I'm not just a hitter, I'm, I'm a baseball player. So uh, I play, just play the game, honestly. Not just focus on hitting, but um, focusing on everything else because there's so many things that, that coaches look for, so many things that they need. So you can't just limit yourself to one thing. This game's gonna humble you. Uh, I, I reiterate that a lot. Um, this game's hard, so just, being able to accept failure, accepting failure is just, just the biggest thing. You're not always gonna, gonna go three for three with two doubles. You're not always gonna, gonna come in a big spot and get a hit. And that's the look of sports. Honoring a civil rights and sports pioneer, the major milestone celebrated in Vero Beach, making sure Jackie Robinson's legacy lives on. 
I'm at Sesney in Vero Beach. 75 years ago this week, Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in baseball. And now this former spring training home of the Dodgers is a tribute to Robinson's legacy. Anybody in line, please take the Facebook engage. I want to make sure I cross you up on this list. A long line of young ball players. You look like you're ready to play ball. Wouldn't miss it for the world. And their parents and grandparents <laughs> couldn't wait. We used to sneak in and play and watch the game. Bobby King remembers those days at the old Dodger Town. Yeah. Now the Jackie Robinson Sports Complex. He's a good baseball player. Hosting young players like his grandkids on a most important day. A day that baseball changed forever. Actually, the world changed forever, and it's all because of Jackie Robinson and what he believed in. 75 years ago, Jackie became the first black player in the big leagues, his legacy extending from Brooklyn to Vero Beach, where he came to play every spring. Tell them about the history with Jackie Robinson being, breaking the color barrier and all that, and uh, what he did for baseball, and what he did is try to keep black kids into baseball. That's what they promote now. Holman Stadium here for decades was the spring training home of the Dodgers. But in 1947, the year Robinson broke the color barrier, the Dodgers trained in Cuba, thinking it best to keep Robinson under wraps until the season started. I think it's important that they know what the number 42 means, what Jackie Robinson means. Tony Regans is with MLB. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, run, 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 go, go, go. Which has turned Dodger Town into a youth baseball center emblazoned with the number 42. Get here, get here, come on, come on. Oh yeah, you're safe, out of way. He also has Jackie stories from his baseball friends. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it, and how you know Preston looked in Jackie's eyes and, and, and the the sadness that was there but all in all jackie knew he had he he was tasked with a job to do he was the first he couldn't give up and a double high five and that's the lesson now for these kids learning the game go to second base go to second base beat it out beat it out beat it out where jackie once played that's one of the cool things about the history these kids will have a chance to kind of learn that as we build this out come on come on at the jackie robinson sports complex in vero beach matt sesney wptv News Channel 5. The Martin County School District is asking for a certain tax to continue to stay competitive. The district's millage rate is set to expire this year, but taxpayers could vote later this summer to keep it. The millage rate helps pay for school security, recruitment and retention and school improvement projects. The last time voters said yes to it was four years ago. Martin County commissioners are hoping to add it to the August election ballot. And because it would be an extension of what taxpayers pay now, there would not be a price increase. And prom is just around the corner for Martin County students. And before the big day for high schoolers, South Fork High wanted to drive home the danger of drunk and distracted driving. The statistics show that car crashes are the number one cause of death for teens. And it's not only because of drunk driving, but also distractions like texting. This week, student actors and first responders reenacted the scene of a horrific crash as a way to show teens the reality of impaired driving. Over and over again, we've heard the feedback that I saw that crash reenactment and it stayed with me and I've never drank and drove. I've never driven impaired. I don't text and drive. And that's our goal. This is the first year the Safety for Life Foundation has visited Martin County. For more than 20 years, the organization has visited hundreds of schools in Palm Beach County, driving home the message to thousands of students. Thank you for joining us from the Adams Ranch in Fort Pierce. Catch us again next Saturday at a new location highlighting the diversity of the Treasure Coast. And remember, you can find more stories about what's going on around the Treasure Coast on our website, WPTV.com. Just click the Treasure Coast link at the top of the homepage. See you next week. Have a great weekend.